Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I'm uh, D.W. Park from Asam Med Medical Center. I'm going to start uh, this uh, great session. In the, this session, title is a Complex PCI E-Training Session 3 and the Rescue Strategy for Complication During uh, Chip Procedure. I'm going to introduce uh, uh, my friend and co-moderator, James Prahati from uh, United States uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. I'm gonna sincerely introduce uh, uh, panelists in the world and uh, Dr. Kafei uh, Du from the uh, China uh, Fai Hospital and uh, Dr. Do Yun Kang from uh, Asa Medical Center Korea and uh, Dr. Michael Yang Lee from Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Achinori Okamura uh, from Japan and Dr. Aniket Fury from New Zealand. So uh, I'm gonna ask co-moderator James uh, Plotty, uh, uh, could you introduce the first speaker? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. It's a real pleasure to be a part of this. Um, we have an excellent uh, panel of moderators and speakers, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Myung Ki Hong from Yonsei University in Seoul. And Dr. Hong will talk about rescue strategies for coronary preparation during complex chip PCI. Dr. Hong, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the title of my presentation is uh, the uh, rescue strategy of uh, coronary artery preparation during a uh, uh, complex PCI. My disclosure, the coronary artery preparation, actually its incidence is uh, rare, but when it occurs, it's a really lethal complication of the PCI. The risk of the coronary artery perforation is uh, directly proportional to the, the complexity of the, the PCI procedure. In usual PCI procedure, its, its incidence was uh, about the 0.5%. However, in the CTO intervention, its incidence was uh, in some study reported at 8.9%, by higher percentage. In hospital mortality is uh, there about uh, uh, 10%. This is uh, data from the UK databases. The study population is of 500,000 of the patient. Among those patients, the incidence of the coronary artery operation was a 0.3%. The factor uh, the, which was associated with a coronary artery operation is uh, the elderly age, and the CTO intervention and the use of the rotational atherectomy, the intervention of the, the side branch occlusion. When the side uh, coronary artery operation occurs, the uh, cardiac event, the clinical course is uh, really, really worse. In hospital maze is a uh, 26%, in hospital mortality is a uh, uh, 8%, and the cardiac tampon side branch occlusion and the emergency bypass surgery is 60%. Clinical outcome is uh, really worse. This is the uh, data from the Japan, the open CTO uh, registry data. So the uh, number of population was uh, 10,000 of patient, 1,000 of patient, the uh, coronary artery population observed in the 89 uh, patient. The instance of the coronary artery population was a uh, 8.9% in the CTO intervention. This patient was uh, divided into two groups, clinical population, which was defined as a population requiring uh, some specific treatment, and the non-clinical population. This is a uh, no specific treatment. In patient with uh, the clinical population, this is uh, the treatment of the modality. Prolonged balloon inf inflation was a 24%. Use of the covered stand, 28%. Embolization is uh, about uh, the 40%. When the, the, uh, what is uh, the clinical outcome? The patient with uh, the clinical uh, operation in hospital death is uh, almost with 21%. Very high percent. In the pericardial synthesis, tampon is a uh, uh, lot of the, the event. What is the, the management of the coronary artery operation? First, general treatment. And the second is that the use of the covered stand, use of the coiling or microsphere. General, uh, when the, the coronary artery operation, the management depends on the, the severity of the coronary artery operation. 
the management also depends on the, the three factors, site of the population and the severity of the insult, finally, hemodynamic stability. Particularly, site is at the big vessel or far distant. Severity is at the confined vessel wall or extend the tissue or extended more in the pericardial space or anatomical space. The, as a, the general management, first step, call for help to the, the other people and the uh, echocardiogram and the prepare the, the, some emergence or urgent pericardial synthesis. Discontinue the, the uh, anti-thrombotic agent and uh, consider to use uh, the IV uh, protamine injection. Prolonged balloon inflation is a important first step to allow the operate to gain the time. What is the, the mechanism? What is the, the population site? What is the next step? When the coronary artery population, most of the, uh, particularly in the unexpectedly occur, most of the intervention is uh, so much embarrassed. What can I do? And therefore, first step is uh, the balloon inflation and the block the, the uh, breathing site, and then take a time and uh, what is the, the next step. Prolonged the balloon inflation, multiple lung may be needed. And in case of the non-lethal coronary artery population, in cases uh, will be treated just from the balloon inflation itself. Use of the, the cover stand is uh, the most important role as a bail out treatment of the coronary artery population, particularly in the proximal or mid vessel segment with uh, the vessel diameter is uh, more than uh, 2.75 millimeters. Actually, this then was uh, covered with a biocompatible polymer polytetraethylene was uh, the covered. The limitation of the covered stent was a side branch occlusion and the occurrence of the stent thrombosis within the stent. There are uh, uh, two types of the covered stent. Grandmaster is a traditional uh, covered stent. Actually, this is a two layer traditional sandwich is design. Recently, the papyrus, this is uh, just a single stent design. Therefore, the delivery of the distance and the use of stand is a more convenient, more useful in the current time. And the, what is the, the delivery technique of the covered stand is a double guiding versus a, in the single guiding technique. The, what is the, the uh, best one for the, uh, in case of the coronary artery population? In case for a small population without the hemodynamic compromise, single guiding technique is a more recommended. In a tortuous vessel with a hemodynamic compromise, two guiding technique is a more useful. The coronary artery population uh, divided in the two types, the, uh, according to the, the vessel size, large vessel, usually proximal or the middle segment, distal vessel, small size of the vessel. What is the, the mechanism of the large vessel, the population, balloon, stand, was uh, about uh, the 30%, coronary wire is a uh, 25%. Distal vessel population is a uh, mainly coronary wire. The management was uh, also different according to the, the uh, vessel size of the uh, coronary artery population. Large vessel from the balloon inflation, 70%, covered stand, 27%, coil embolism is uh, the uh, more smaller, the uh, 16%. However, in the distal vessel is a prolonged balloon inflation and the coil embolism. Use of the coiling or microsphere was uh, considered particularly in the distal or more precise uh, placement for the coiling. Actually coiling can be delivered through the, the guiding caster or micro caster. There is another uh, the use of the material of the microsphere Another uh, material for the, the management of the coronary artery population is a thrombin injection, autologous blood clot, and the fat embolism. However, personally, I never experienced of the, this kind of the material for the uh, coronary artery population. In summary, the general treatment for the coronary artery population was uh, the uh, balloon, prolonged balloon inflation first, and uh, the uh, IV fluid or vasopressor. And uh, if it is needed, uh, prepare the, the pericardial synthesis and uh, notice the, the surgeon for the, the some 
urgent or the uh, continued uh, the breathing uh, complication. When the, even though the, we did uh, the general treatment, the persist the extravasation in the large vessel population, we use the covered stand or prolonged balloon inflation. Distal vessel perforation, embolization, or prolonged balloon inflation, but continue that the breathing extravasation is surgery. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude that the perforation actually this instance was a rare. However, it is an inevitable complication, particularly in the uh, complex PCI, especially in the uh, CTO intervention. Therefore, rapid assessment and that the uh, available treatment is necessary. And the, we always prepare the, the worst scenario of the coronary artery perforation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, uh, James, uh, could you introduce the next speaker? Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Hong. That was excellent. We will have time for questions at the end of the lectures. Our next speaker is Dr. Cheong Jenwu from Taiwan, and he will speak about rescue strategies for no refill during complex chip PCI. Dr. Wu. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Actually, my talk will be uh, a little bit uh, case-based. Yes, um, um, I have nothing to disclose. And so the complete uh, chip definition is complete higher risk in indicated PCI. So Critical factors including advanced heart failure, advanced age, uh, chronic disease, including CKD, stroke, diabetes, and also history of previous open heart surgery. But the lesion characteristics of uh, chip PCI include its left main bifurcation, uh, challenge in progress, cast by long uh, CTO, mario vessel tendon disease, combined valvular progress, uh, out stenosis, mitral regurgitation. So the team, uh, I think, Considering of complete revascularization, we have to be the team capable of dealing with the CTO lesion. That is a must. And also, my site, I think imaging guidance to achieve the best result is uh, strongly recommended. So this is one of the examples we can see that uh, the patient coming with a multiple risk factor, he have non stemi collection shock, LVF on arrival is 17%. So that was in the 2017, December 30. So RCA was uh, very diffuse disease and uh, uh, chronic collocution of mid the distal portion. And also he have a, a borderline left main lesion, diffuse disease in the LED and so on effects. And we can see some collateral from septal branch to the uh, distal RCA. So for this case, because uh, in our center, we published uh, the early initiation of ECMO IBP, uh, two papers uh, suggested early initiation of ECMO can be safe, uh, you know, the, so 30, 30 days mortality rate can be short, can be safe. So this is an IBP and ECMO inserted, and we go from a distal radio to have ACEs, then we uh, uh, revascularize for the uh, left main, RAD, and uh, second phase. And the final result was uh, putting a four drug eluting stents. So in my point, uh, most of the time, for example, in this case, CABG was declined by surgeon due to the holiday because we have to waiting for the next day will be 31st and will be a happy new year so at least 40 hours waiting therefore pci risk for this patient are very higher risk than the uh, pci for the non-chip patient so combined uh, cardiovascular intervention is cvs surgeon and anesthesiologist as a team approach will be very important so in considering a chip pci procedure i think we have the first thinking about vascular assays and the drugs in my lab. Usually for this kind of chip patient, we have to prepare norepinephrine on the table, one milligram diluted into a 10 ml. Uh, so each bolus will be a 50 to 100 micro. That is very effective for the transient hypotension. IV top of course, nitroglycerin. Hemodynamic support, I think that James will be uh, giving a talk regarding uh, how to do a, a hematic support. A junkie PCI device, I think if the patient is very classified, you want to use a rotational hysterectomy laser or orbital or the IVL, I think we have to prepare it beforehand. So one of the examples, uh, 56 years old male with uh, half failures, functional three, uh, hyperlipidemia, current smoker. He was referred from the community hospital, considered candidate for heart transplant. 
transplantation because every year only about 14 percent normal renal function cholesterol 305 milligrams per deciliter it's quite high no diabetes so the first operator using a left radio ACEs using six French IL4 for diagnosis and also considering PCI uh, this is an uh, injection for, for RCA. You can see that the uh, RCA was uh, supported from plasma portion. And you can see a corner range giving character to the uh, LED. Uh, and also, we can see that the uh, second phase in the plasma also has a critical stenosis and uh, bridging character to the distal for dominant second phase. LED to diagonal have a critical stenosis 90%. And after that, we have a uh, Possible TME one flow to the LED, but uh, most of the LED was corrupted from the constraint. So we calculate our syntax score was 33. Euro score two was 2.86. Of course, this patient is a good candidate for bypass surgery. However, because the patient, he is a single, no other family support, he declined the surgeon uh, bypass surgery. So uh, the first operator is thinking he can take the uh, uh, some team one flow maybe have a micro channel, so use a XTA or try to pass that uh, uh, total region and use a uh, five French for the control after injection. Uh, it seems like the wire has been into a distal LED, but however, uh, Michael Kester cannot pass even using a, uh, a anchor balloon in the second phase of plasma. So, uh, in that point, I was invited to join the procedure. So, we switched gear. I think we have to fix that the non CTO segment so quickly. Uh, pass the wire into the subtotal RCA pre dilatation and this get this imaging and uh, imaging guided. So we put a 2.5 by 33 stents here and pass by 30 and get a final good result. And quickly switch to uh, seven French from six French. A guy have a better backup, so we quickly put a stent into the seven frames. And after that, we can more concentrate on the LED uh, subtotal following by CTO. So this is a ballooning dilatation for the LED and diagonal. And after that, we switched from XTA to CP12, able to pass that uh, uh, CTO and uh, proof by collateral. But in that more in that point, um, smallest balloon we cannot pass. Also, we try to use a turnpike goal, but also fail. So we changed using a microcaster at the tip of the CTO exit. We changed rotor floppy wire try to do a rotational hysterectomy, but at that moment, we had uh, some complications. See that the acute occlusion and the diagonal branch, we have to do a dilatation. And you, just see, you can see that the thrombus formation in the left main portion. So we started to do a thrombus suction from uh, uh, diagonal and also from the uh, circumflex and suck out this uh, thrombus and even have a chunk thrombus in the LED and diagonal bifurcation. So we have to use a guide extension uh, try to suck as much as possible for the dead man LED thrombus, but uh, still not very effective. Uh, the hematomics was compromised, so we have to put the intrauterine balloon pumped. And after that, we consider maybe we have to do a stage procedure. So we finally removed the wire from LED uh, get outs. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the thrombus was embolized into a certain base of two marginal junction. We have to do another thrombus suction to try to get the final TM3 flow in that uh, uh, circumflex and OM. So that procedure was takes about uh, three hours and uh, uh, IBP was supported for two days. And uh, we consider the state of procedure and we go for bilateral radio uh, two days later. So we can see that uh, at this moment, we still can see some residual thrombus in the LAD diagonal and septic junction. CTO was uh, just after the diagonal branch. So after ballooning, uh, anchor in here, but the micro still cannot go. Uh, the smallest balloon, we use 1.0 and uh, green plasty able to bring another new one to pass. Then we change rotor, uh, break the rotor floppy wire. Then after that, we do a several pass of the rotational strengthening. And that after that, we are able to do a balloon dilatation and uh, imaging. Uh, for safe time, I, I don't, uh, show that's because our CT is showing that uh, critical centers, they have a lot of casting. So using the imaging, we do a further balloon dilatation 3O, very aggressive. After that, uh, we're putting a stand 3O by 48 in the LED plasma portion. And after that, we do a part 3.5 by 15. And after that, 
uh, we lost the diagonal again. Then we have to rescue uh, by wiring and final kissing in the LED in the diagonal. And after that, we're considering of complete revascularization. So we're using the XTA again in the uh, second fix. Uh, luckily, we are able to pass and ballooning. Then we are using the old CD guidance, putting a stent in the structural portion. And this is a final uh, angel. Probably I can show you the last two slides. And here, uh, I borrow from the uh, check intervention regarding the acute no referral phenomena that do have a lot of mechanism. One of the mechanism due to dissection or maybe due to eye match, probably you have to do an imaging uh, guide treatment using an IVUS or the OCT. But like this patient, we have a thrombus formation. So thrombosuction, 2 v 3 a bailout, or intracoronary thrombolysis might be another option for direct thrombin inhibitor would be a, another option. But prevention is very important, I think, uh, like this case, we have to prevent uh, in it front. And if uh, you have that kind of phenomenon, it's not due to mechanical obstruction, uh, it's due to the small embolites, you can use intracoronary uh, coronary dilator like adenosine, nitroprusides, nicaribine, or brapamir. So in this case, I think we have initial giving a heparin 6,000 by his uh, body weight, uh, 100 units. But after that, we ate it to 3,000. Uh, we didn't use a 2 v 3 as a routine, but we, my mistake, because we didn't check the ACT before PCI and every 30 minutes, so that disaster happens. In CASEP, without available in peril, I think IBP ECMO combination for very high risk PCI, bilateral arm approach, such as bilateral radio, would be the only option for the uh, CTO setting. Any PCI complication can be happened in chip patients, such as thrombus, emboli, perforation, or rotabur entrapment, et cetera. Therefore, for me, with uh, managing uh, complication is also very important. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wu. Uh, I'm going to introduce the uh, last speaker, and then we will have discussion time. Last speaker, speaker and James uh, Prouty from Northwestern in Chicago, and the last strategy for carotid shock uh, during complex chip PCI. And uh, Dr. Plati, please. Thank you again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about rescue strategies for cardiogenic shock during complex chip PCI. I have nothing to disclose. I'm also going to use a case-based format. This is a 43-year-old gentleman with anterior ST, ST elevation. And we can see that there is a proximal mid LED occlusion. Predilation leads to quick restoration of flow. The vessel is stented with two drugaline stents, and then afterwards, as no flow, no reflow, goes into dramatic, profound shock. What to do next? Vasodilators, vasopressors, LV support device, a lot of options. We decided to put a impella ventricular support device in stabilized the patient, then gave intracoronary vasodilators, post-dilated an image of the vessel, and he did absolutely fine. So PCI has turned into a fairly safe procedure. Here's a uh, 4,000 patient uh, study looking at mortality rates of 2% at 30 days, and about 40% of the deaths were attributed to the PCI itself. Uh, mostly due to stent thrombosis. So in general, PCI is very safe, but not always. You can have hemodynamic collapse due to thrombosis, ischemia, no reflow, dissection, arrhythmia or rest, side branch occlusion, hemorrhage, perforation with tamponade, air embolism. There's other causes too, but these are some of the more common. And once somebody goes into shock, there is a sequela, the spiral they may call it, with increased filling pressures, ischemia, and it just kind of is a vicious cycle that you need to get out of. The use of mechanical circula circulatory support in the US has risen in the last decade, both in heart failure patients and in PCI cases with more use of balloon pumps and peripheral VADs. Um, this may reflect availability of devices and also the increased complexity of chip patients. However, 
The data on using support devices in our sickest patients is limited. The shock 2 trial um, from eight years ago did not show a benefit of balloon pump use in acute amyloid shock. And more recently, a smaller study comparing balloon pump with CP and Pella that was unable to show a benefit. Carl Sagan once said, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. These trials are very difficult to do, uh, and they're very difficult to, to prove an endpoint. But we know that in certain cases, we need mechanical support to get out of a tough situation. Here's another case, 86-year-old woman undergoing to a tavern procedure, and she goes into incessant V-fib right after. So we shoot an angiogram, we see the left main is occluded. This is a different case, but this will resonate with anyone who does this for a living, trying to do a PCI during CPR. Well, some cath labs around the world have automated CPR machines that could be positioned very quickly, uh, and they can actually make getting out of one of these situations easier uh, with less interference to the operator. Back to the case, we placed her on ECMO. We did thrombectomy. Then we did uh, mini crush here in the large diagonal. And within an hour, she was off ECMO uh, and fully recovered. ECMO has come a long way. The heart lung machine was developed in 1953. Bedside ECMO in the early 70s, a huge apparatus, much smaller, an inpatient ECMO circuit now. And now we have portable ECMO circuits that can be used uh, in the field or in the cath lab. So here are the contemporary LV support devices. There are others that are in development, but I'll focus on these. Intraaortic balloon pump displaces blood during diastole in the aorta. The impella is placed in the left ventricle and sucks blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta. The tandem heart takes blood directly out of the left atrium and recirculates it into the aortic circulation. And ECMO takes blood out of the venous system, oxygenates it, and puts it back in the arterial circulation. Here's some comparison of the, the, the different devices, the level of support. Certainly, the balloon pump is the least LV support. The other devices have larger cannula size. They're associated with more cost. Uh, ECMO can provide RV support and oxygenation. Some more pros and cons. The balloon pump is quick, easy, cheap, but it's only a modest support at best. And Pella is quick, easy, and more powerful. Uh, it is larger board and more expensive. ECMO can be done in, quickly at the bedside by an experienced team. Uh, it's probably the best for cardiac arrest. It provides biventricular support in oxygenation, but it's large. You need local expertise, and you may need a left ventricular vent, like a balloon pump or an impella, to unload the left ventricle. The tandem heart is a great device, but it's, it's more cumbersome, requires a transeptal, uh, so it takes a really experienced team to be able to do this quickly. Um, factors in choosing. What's the rhythm and blood pressure? If a patient is getting full-blown cardiac arrest, sometimes going straight to ECMO is gonna save their life the quickest. Uh, vascular access size, oxygenation, RV function. Do they have valvular lesions for those devices that cross the aortic valve? Local equipment and expertise is important and cost, of course, is a consideration. There are direct RV support devices um, that are much used much less, but I just wanna mention them. Let's show another case, 89-year-old woman with an end STEMI, very tight proximal LAD lesion, not really a cabbage candidate. 90% proximality, let's do PCI. Everybody's excited. Get a guide catheter in, the wire won't go, we take a shot. Left main occlusion, likely guide dissection. She has chest pain, ST elevation, hypotension, what do you do next? Well, we call from a hub, get more hands on deck. Get a, this was done transradially, so we get immediate femoral artery and venous access. Add low-dose dopamine. Uh, able to wire the LAD and do an IBIS to confirm that our distal wire is interluminal. Also wired the circumflex and IBIS that. You see the hematoma there in the circ into the large OM and confirmed that that was interluminal. Predilated the LED. At this point, she's stable. Uh, put a stent in the osteal cirque to the OM. 
and then did a T stenting from the left main to the proximal LED, added a second stent, potted, re -ivist, optimized everything. Here's the final angiographic result. You can see the residual dissection and wall hematoma. Lefty Gomez was a old United States baseball pitcher. He said, it's better to be lucky than good. And uh, sometimes that's true. <laughs> the guidelines in Europe and the United States don't really provide heavy recommendations for the use of support devices, even in patients that are already in shock before you start the PCI. In fact, we get a 2B recommendation and that's partly because the evidence is lacking, but again, these are very hard things to prove. Our uh, interventional society, Sky in the US, has recently come up with this pyramid, A, B, C, D, E, to really characterize different stages of shock and identify those that are at risk or in early shock. Patients you might be more concerned about uh, when approaching PCI. I wanted to mention this concept. This is a study that's going on uh, STEMI DTU, door to unloading, in patients STEMI without shock, putting a impeller device in to unload the ventricle and to see if that reduces the infarct side. This is from an animal study that showed that this strategy, just unloading the ventricle at a high risk patient, uh, may reduce infarct size. So, a new concept. Here's a, a kind of a busy protocol, but this is our own institutional program on how to support patients or bail them out in a high risk case. I won't go through it in detail. But I want to summarize by saying, be prepared. Uh, radial access uh, preserves the femorals if you need to quickly access them for larger board devices. Consider a placeholder in high risk in cases, a four or five French sheath in one of the femoral arteries to be able to quickly mobilize a larger device. Have a well-defined emergency protocol. Don't panic. Ask for help. You're going to need it. Know the equipment you have in your lab and the personnel. And it's always helpful to debrief the team afterward, uh, go over what went right, what went wrong, what you can do better the next time. And that's all I have. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I think we'll move now to uh, question and answer and discussion among the panel. Hey, James, great. So I think that uh, this session is very helpful to understand and how to manage a lot of you know, serious complication for during the CHIP procedure. And for this session, we invited uh, definitely PCI champion in the world, uh, especially in the Asian Pacific area in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, New Zealand. So any, any question and any discussion is okay. And uh, could you start any question? Dr. Hong, I have a question for you. Excellent lecture. Uh, you mentioned the use of protamine for perforation. Um, this makes people very uncomfortable because protamine may, may accelerate clot in a, in a vessel that you're including. If you give protamine, when do you feel comfortable giving protamine in a perforation? At what point? The, uh, you know, the coronary artery perforation is that the almost the, most of the cases are unexpected. It's a surprising. So the, when it occurs, it's a surprise. So the, uh, when it occurs, the, first of all, the intervention is that the, who have uh, the, a lot of the, the experience. It depends on the, the career. So they uh, may be lesser embarrassed, but the, the young intervention is the usually so embarrassed. So the, uh, they cannot uh, the, uh, the, uh, adapt to uh, such kind of situation. So the, I think is that the most important step was a call for the, the other people. And uh, please help, uh, help me is uh, the most important one. And uh, the, the next step, the uh, such kind of event, uh, I usually uh, the, uh, teach to the, my the fellow or the young interventionist, uh, inflate uh, the balloon first uh, and occlude it and uh, take and uh, save uh, more time. And uh, then oh, what can I do? And uh, the, uh, the, in my experience, uh, most of the cases, uh, uh, I think it's uh, the, the uh, first step is uh, maybe 50 or 60 cases is uh, the, maybe the, uh, uh, treated with a balloon itself. And then if something happened, and then I will think about the, the next step. And if, if as a follow-up. Just I'd like to share your, maybe the question regarding the programming use, because uh, in our lab, yeah, yeah, in our lab we're using only neutralized 
the half dose of the heparin. So we like to keep the ACT, for example, between 150 to 200, not the neutralized of all heparin. Because once you put a stand in, you have a price, all the heparins, half dose of the heparin. That's my cast lab uh, routine. I don't know, maybe uh, other uh, lab is maybe a different option. I, I like to hear from the uh, Tokyo Fei from Y mm. Hospital. And what Dr. Is your Wu, uh, yeah. uh, would you ever give protein? About the protein, uh, uh, I never use protein uh, when the perforation uh, happened because I'm really afraid of um, other uh, thorn bursts happen. Uh, so uh, for me, the first thing I should do is to to use a balloon to seal the 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 the, the perforation part and then try to cover it. Uh, just like Doctor Wu, uh, uh, Doctor Hong uh, said just now, the, for the the bigger, uh, big vessel, uh, we, we use cover stems. A uh, smaller vessel, we use embodies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a, a question to Dr. Wu. I noticed that in your complicated cases, you use the bilateral uh, uh, snuff box artery. Uh, is that very easy to use seven French guiding catheter wire snuff box? Uh, in, in our experience, because we have a series of uh, a double study after the, the, the a snap box assays. But usually, I think in Korea, they have also reports that uh, somewhat smaller than the regular radio uh, assays. So between 2.3 to 2.4 for the distal. So in that case, we use a right sheet slender or maybe China made uh, slender sheet can be adaptable because the six French can be getting the seven French guide. I, I don't know, so James, you have the same experience using a, uh, you know, that uh, the Grashi Steromo using a seven French front radio. Uh, is that available, right? In, in US? It, it is. So, in usually this case, it would be fine. That is, yeah, can I answer your question? We okay, can use stuff box for the left radio uh, mm -hmm. as it makes it easier to, to pull that arm over the patient and access it. Okay, I, I have a question. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, go, okay. Go uh, yeah, yeah I, I have a question to the uh, Japanese uh, the CTO interventionist, Dr. Okamura, and you have a lot of uh, CTO intervention experience. Also, I, I expect you have a lot of experience for coronary population during the CTO, in CTO intervention. What is your best <coughs> strategy to control the bleeding in the CTO intervention? Uh, so, yeah, uh, usually same as the uh, protamin uh, neutralization. So usually the SED time is uh, 150. And if I make the perforation as a distal part or the retrograde tunnels, I usually use the uh, thrombus. And also I am thinking about the uh, coil. And uh, the important point is a combination of the coil and then put the thrombus or the fat is a uh, yeah, yeah, definitely good way uh, to, stop mm -hmm. the uh, to stop the bleeding. So only the coil, sometimes there's a, some leak. But if you put the uh, thrombus, or if you put the uh, fat uh, into that part, it's uh, definitely an easy way to stop it, uh, even mm -hmm. in the yeah, retrograde, it's called the channel. Mm -hmm. And also the main yeah, big uh, proximal part, yeah, I usually uh, do the yeah, balloon inflation and ACT control. Uh, then if difficult, maybe uh, same as the, I would use the uh, and also, what about the perfusion balloon? Because in Japan, they are very yeah, 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 yeah. We usually use the perfusion balloon, but uh, in CTO case, uh, normal balloon is okay, but uh, no CTO cases, perfusion balloon is okay. Uh, better, I uh, usually uh, mm -hmm. we usually use it. And also, uh, if I make the major, uh, very big operation, uh, especially at the uh, in uh, in the retrograde tunnels, maybe the uh, uh, the yeah, fibrin guru. Fibrin guru is a very yeah, good yeah, device. Mm -hmm. yeah, fibrin mm -hmm. guru is not allowed to use inside the vessel, uh, but uh, it can be used. Yeah, if we use it, uh, you can stop it yeah, very easily. So mm -hmm. if it is difficult to stop the uh, bleeding, especially in the epicardial channels, uh, maybe uh, fibrin guru is a final uh, yeah, result, a uh, final uh, way to stop the bleeding. Yeah, so my, my experience. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a, a Professor Hong and the, you introduced, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we gonna, we have some big population in proximal part and the severe calcified region putting covered stand is not easy. And the, you introduced right. the double guiding caster technique. I don't have experience about double guiding caster technique. How can you do? And the, do, do any other panelists share the experience? This is very important for beginner interventionist. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's uh, very important for all interventionists to master this because uh, it is going to be very helpful uh, when you especially have a proximal vessel perforation, big vessel perforation, because there's no time for you to deflate the balloon to allow uh, you change, exchange for uh, the stand ground. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, most of the time you will go for uh, femoral uh, because it is the most uh, easy uh, route to use. So just do a femoral puncture, put in another guiding, uh, but you have to uh, uh, de uh, uh, disengage the original guiding a bit to, uh, for you to allow mm -hmm. the second guiding to get close to the, um, to, the, uh, uh, to the main or the ostium of the vessel. And then uh, when you are going to pass the guide wire, you have to deflate the balloon and then quickly pass the guide wire and then inflate the balloon again. And then you can do whatever uh, other procedures if needed. Like you want to put in another balloon, if you want to put in a stand graph, it's much easier to just go in with the device, deflate the balloon, take the balloon out, and then put the device in. I think this is uh, very important uh, for all the uh, PCI operators to master this technique. It's mm -hmm. going to be very helpful and life-saving for some patients. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, I agree. So the first step, with a large preparation after after the balloon is up, is to get get more vascular access. Be ready with to get a second guide in, um, and maybe get double vascular access. Be ready for a support device too. Okay. And uh, Dr. Fury, how about uh, you know? I have a question to you. Uh, do you frequently use the MCS supported the high risk PCI and the Impella or you know? No, we don't, have, we don't have the impeller here. Um, we still are old fashioned uh, third world with uh, using intra aortic balloon pumps if, if needed. In fact, that was going to be my question to, to James that um, mm -hmm. um, do you use um, IABP uh, up front or do you keep it for, um, uh, for later, you know, in, in a high risk, especially in a STEMI kind of a situation? Uh, if you're anticipating hemodynamic problems, uh, this is a question that we always have, whether we should uh, have it ready to go up front or just uh, or, or carry on and wait for it for later. So, I, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. There's always a, a gradient of, and I showed that sky quick classification of how bad the shock is. Um, if they're in stage C shock, then, then we may go straight to an impella. If they're in, in B, we, we may use a balloon pump. So it depends on the level of support you need. Uh, we do, as many of you probably do, we do the vast majority of our STEMIs transradially. Um, so we're able to get dual access from the femorals. Um, again, the data on impella versus balloon pump has been lacking and part of that is because these trials are very difficult to do. Um, so I, I think you have to use the, the, device, the, the devices that you have available to, to you in your lab. So, and the James, I have one question, you know, uh, as, a, as a, the young interventional cardiologist, our team in the Dr. Do Yung Gang and the recently uh, I, I, my feeling is about the young interventional cardiologist much frequently, much easily adapt, uh, you know, MCS ECMO. You know, previously, I, I, I'm some middle age interventionist. I first select IABP, if failed ECMO, but nowadays, uh, uh, young interventional cardiology patient, the viral status is not so good, and they put the ECMO, and they select the Impella rather than IABP. And the, could you uh, recommend some threshold to select a more aggressive, uh, you know, MCS uh, like Impella or ECMO rather than IBP? I think ECMO uh, has definitely emerged in the last really five to 10 years as a real bailout device. Um, 
we have eCPR teams in the hospital. So if, if a younger patient were to arrest in the hospital, we have a team of ECMO ready to go to consider it. Um, now there are special ECMO devices that can be used in the cath lab uh, or there are ECMO, surgical ECMO teams. So ECMO I think is really best used in a patient who, who is really a, threatening to die. They have a refractory arrhythmia, they have such profound shock, they have hypoxemia and can't be ventilated, uh, so you get oxygenation. Uh, those, are the, those are the cases where I wanna call immediately for ECMO. Uh, and the nice thing is once you get the cannulas in, uh, it really calms everything down. Now the downside, particularly in acute MI, is ECMO provides a large volume load and can put stress on the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. So typically at some yep. point you'll have to, to use a venting strategy. It may be as simple as a balloon pump or an impeller cannula to, or even a pigtail cap in the left ventricle to unload that left ventricle if you need ongoing ECMO support. Uh, but the first thing to do is get, you can get somebody on ECMO within 10 minutes and really, really prevent a death that way. Is that, how about the status, uh, Dr. Dew, uh, uh, and that you are, you know, some, uh, a fire hospital is the largest number of hospital in the world. And uh, uh, which kind of MCS available is what is your preference or what is your strategy for treatment, cardiogenic shock or, you know, very high risk patient? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a very, uh, very important question. I think uh, uh, in FY now, uh, I, we have uh, IBP and, uh, and the ECMO. But we don't have impact because of the price issue. It's, it's too expensive in China. Uh, it's around, uh, I think, uh, 40,000 40, US dollars in China. So uh, we, we don't use impact. Uh, but usually uh, for the patient, uh, uh, a very complicated patient and, uh, uh, and the low, uh, with low ejection fraction. In Fly Hospital, usually they are the candidate uh, for cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgery. Um, a um, uh, cardiac surgeon in Fly Hospital use more ECMO than, than uh, interventional cardiologists. But for some patients, uh, uh, the anatomy is uh, very complicated, but they, uh, well, we, we, can, uh, we can evaluate uh, the cardiac arrest the risk is not very high. Well, we always use our IVP first. Uh, very rare, um, we, we use IVP combined with ECMO in advance. Uh, to treat some special patients. Mm. I think it also depends on the clinical condition of the patient. If the patient comes in with cardiac arrest with no cardiac output at all, then we should probably put in an ECMO as soon as possible. But as uh, in the case of Dr. Wu, there is still uh, some sort of cardiac output, but uh, like ejection fraction 10, 15%. Then in our yeah. institution, probably uh, we will put in an impeller first. Mm before we start the PCI procedure, because mm. these are really the cheap high-risk patients. And you will an yeah. anticipate complications, uh, hemodynamic compromise during the mm -hmm. procedure. So we yes. will probably put in impeller first. And as James has pointed out, yeah. ECMO is yeah. Beforehand. Bad, yeah, bad to the heart because it increases mm -hmm. the afterload and whatever LV function you have, you will actually depress the LV function even further uh, with the uh, ECMO. Mm -hmm. But ECMO can provide whole circulatory support as well as uh, respiratory mm. support. It mm. provides oxygenation as well. Mm. So it all depends on the clinical condition of the uh, patient. And as I showed in Mike, one Michael, case, Christian, Michael, uh, yes. for example, how long for this patient you put the impera prophylaxis and how long you can remove that uh, uh, impera? Just finish the procedure or you stay for overnight or when you would consider uh, remove the impera? No, I will, for, for high risk PCI, we usually can take the impeller out after the procedure, before we leave the cath lab. Mm -hmm. But we usually, apart from the okay. impeller, we put a uh, Swan Gans catheter in as well. We look at the right heart uh, cath readings. We calculate the cardiac output, we calculate the Pepsi uh, score and mm -hmm. Pepsi score, and then decide uh, whether mm -hmm. we should uh, take, uh, bring the impeller out. For patients in cardiogenic shock, Usually, we will take the impeller out and uh, 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 give, uh, keep the impeller on for a few days 
and then monitor the hemodynamics, uh, the uh, PA pressure, so on, lactate, and see how the patient is doing before we take the impeller out. That's an excellent point. If it's a long procedure in a patient with a low EF, um, doing a right heart cath can really help you make those decisions on how much longer they need support. Okay, Dr. Do you have any question? Yeah. Oh, yes, I have a question to Dr. Wu's case. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And you said you sh uh, uh, the large thrombus occurred in the left main to LAD. And uh, routinely, uh, you, you uh, talked that you did not check the ACT at the time, but during the procedure, do you routinely check ACT for all PCA cases or not? Because, because it is not routine, um, in fact, mm. in our center for routine PCI cases. I have a uh, procedure. Is, I was in the middle of the procedure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, in our case, routinely, in, in our case, we routinely check the ACT every one hour. I think for this patient, maybe we have shortening that interval to using uh, 30 minutes interval in every cases. So that is a uh, kind of routine. Okay, okay. Any any additional question? Okay, I think this is a very, you know, interactive and very educational session for a beginner or junior interventional cardiologist to learn a lot of technical tips and tricks for interventional cardiologists. Dr. James, could you sum up the, this session and close up the, uh, this session? Well, I want to thank the panelists and particularly I want to thank Dr. Hong and Dr. Wu for excellent uh, lectures on coronary preparation and coronary no reflow. Um, hopefully that we'll, we'll all be able to meet sometime in person uh, once things are safer, but uh, until then, I uh, wish everyone good well and uh, thank you for teaching us everything. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Stay safe, bye. Michael, thank you, and the Dr. Thank Wu, you. and the Dr. Yes. Fury, thank you, appreciate. Yes. Dr. Duo, thank you, good to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Okamura, bye thank bye. you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.